You may recall last spring, uh, the Vancouver Police Department announced that we uh, partnered with Redgrave Research Forensic Sciences to analyze some DNA from two victims in Vancouver's oldest murder case. This case is commonly known as the Babes in the Woods. This is a case that has puzzled investigators since 1953, just shy of 70 years ago, when the bodies of two young boys were discovered by a groundskeeper near Beaver Lake in Stanley Park, a long time ago. Until now, the case has remained unsolved and the identity of the children unknown. Today, I'm pleased to announce that the Vancouver Police Department has positively identified the two young victims as David and Derek Dalton. Back in uh, 1947, they were aged six and seven years old, respectively, at the times of their deaths. So, really young. The murders of David and Derek have haunted generations of homicide investigators. It brings me great satisfaction to be able to stand here today to give these children, finally, after this many years, a name, and to bring some closure to this horrific crime. Last week, members of the investigative team had an opportunity to meet with distant relatives of Derek and David, and to inform them of our investigative findings. The family members have decided not to be here today, and we want to respect their privacy by not providing personal details on them. In May of 2020, I was privileged to be assigned the file 1953-6361, commonly known as Babes in the Woods. In reviewing the file, it was very easy to understand why so many detectives that had it before me, were determined and dedicated to get some closure for this file and determined to find what the boys' names were. We had two boys who were brutally murdered in, and left in the forest of Stanley Park for five years before they were found. And then for approximately 70 years after, they were only known as babes in the woods. I decided that I would continue with my predecessors um, passion and try to see if I could be the one to give them a name with all the help that was given to me prior. Um, I knew we had the boys' bones and I decided to make contact with various labs in order to see if there was a way that we could get identity just from DNA. The hurdle we had to overcome at the time was the fact that these, the DNA in these bones was very degraded. I was very fortunate to make contact with Dr. Redgrave and his team, who had already worked John and Jane Doe cases in the past with success using forensic genealogy. With the assistance of the BC Coroner Service, we were able to get the bone fragments to a lab who, after a couple of times, were successful in extracting a usable uh, DNA sample. From that sample, we were able to sequence it and upload it to GEDmatch, which is the website and the ancestry DNA thing that uh, Dr. Redgrave uses to do his science magic. I'm not gonna stand here and try to give you guys um, the full explanation on the science behind this. I'll leave that to the expert, which is Dr. Redgrave. Uh, we knew that with Dr. Redgrave's help, there were good odds of finding a living family member. They had to be somewhere out there. However, our work would not be complete once we discovered a, pa a partial match, we still had significant amount of work to do on our end, locating family members, um, checking school records, in order to be able to confirm specific details about the victims. We still didn't know their names, but we knew where we could start looking and we could find it. Dr. Redgrave was instrumental um, in allowing us the opportunity to move forward on this case. One can only imagine what it feels like to have a homicide detective call you and say, well, we think you might be related to a couple of victims in a historical file. Um, when we spoke to this family member, obviously they were at first surprised, but immediately asked if it was in reference to one of their parents' brothers. We had the opportunity to sit with the family member and learned more about these boys, whom we learned they called Derek and David. Dalton. The story that had been handed down to them was that the boys had been removed from the residence by the ministry, and even though this family member did their best to talk about the boys and try to get the story, the only response they got from family was silence. Um, the absence of the boys was never discussed. This family member felt it was important to find 
either the boys or their descendants, and so they made decision to upload their DNA to myheritage.com. Unfortunately, this is not the website that Dr. Redgrave uses, but after sitting with this family member and talking about the story, they were very willing to upload the DNA to GEDmatch. Once the family member agreed to do this, Dr. Redgrave was able to confirm without a doubt that these boys were related to this family. We then got to work on our end, looking at school records, and we were able to confirm that Derek Dalton, born on February 27, 1940, and David Dalton, born on June 24, 1941, were in fact the babes in the woods. In closing, I would really like to thank everyone who's ever been a part in solving this case. While I'm the one standing here today, the credit must be given to the many investigators who came before me and vowed never to give up, our colleagues at the BC Coroner Service, and the dedicated professionals at, at Redgrave Research who were instrumental in this investigation, and the citizens of Vancouver who daily entrust the men and women of the Vancouver Police Department to keep them safe every day. So the basic process of how forensic genetic genealogy works is that we receive a digital file that is similar to what one might receive if they take a direct-to-consumer DNA test. But the process uh, to get that file goes through several different labs because of how degraded uh, unidentified human remains tend to be. Uh, once we have this file, we are able to upload it to either GEDmatch or Family Tree DNA. In this instance, we only use GEDmatch to compare to other living people who have willingly uploaded their DNA for comparison to others and have opted into law enforcement matching. Um, and then we do something very similar to what an adoptee might do when trying to find their birth parents by uh, building out the family trees of the living matches, finding out how they connect to each other and therefore how the unidentified person may relate to them based on uh, shared DNA between them all. It's a process called triangulation. We will start with the trees of the known people in the database, find out where they connect, and if we have two or more people who connect to a common ancestor and a third unidentified person who shares DNA with them, we can assume that that person descends from that same common ancestor somehow. Uh, depending on how distant the relatives are that we're working with, this process can take a long time because we'll need more of those common ancestors and figuring out how they fit together to make the sequence of the person that we're trying to ID. And in this instance, we were able to identify common ancestors on the first day that we had the file and spent the next 24 days trying to make sure that we were in the right family of interest, um, doing research on this small family group to figure out where there might be a person who was unaccounted for. And that brought us to Derek and David's family. So after I uh, received the uh, position of... Uh detective sergeant in the provincial unsolved homicide unit I wasn't carrying a caseload I thought I would like to have a look at it because it, the media had uh, resurrected it so many times and by the way the media are the one that gave the uh, name of the babes in the woods it's from a Shakespeare's play and that stuck with the file so after uh, resurre resurrecting it I discovered that uh, the remains were um, on display in the Vancouver Police Museum. I did not think that was appropriate. So I went down one day without any authority from any of my superiors and I seized all their remains. I took them out to my very good friend, Dr. David Sweet here at the Bureau of Legal Dentistry at UBC. And while I held the skulls, David was able to extract a tooth from each of the skulls. And then I'll, I'll pass it over to him in a minute to explain uh, uh, what he did. But after that, I took the remains to a crematorium that will remain strictly with me because I'm not going to identify it to you. And uh, I had the remains minus the skulls cremated. And then I arranged to have the remains taken with a police boat off of Kitts Line of Point and with the police chaplain at that time, dedicated the remains to the ocean. 
we had a nice little service and the children's festival was on, but that was not planning on my part, it just was coincidence. Now after the remains uh, were interred into the sea, uh, Dr. Sweet and I kept it to ourselves what biological remains were kept for future advancement in DNA and scientific research. We kept that secret for a lot of years and we didn't release that because we thought it sounded kind of ghoulish for people that wanted to know and believe me there were people that wanted to know but we kept that to ourselves. So the fallacy of that they were running out of DNA is incorrect because there were lots of teeth in those skulls and Dr. Sweet, God bless him, was able to uh, extract DNA by pulverizing one of the teeth and I'll ask him to explain it. Sergeant Honeyborn wanted to confirm that in fact the information that was in the file at the time he was looking at it was true and we could use modern DNA evidence of the day, mid-1990s, to extract a usable DNA source and to confirm that it was in fact a boy and a girl. Um, we have developed at my laboratory this technology for extracting DNA from teeth and from bones. Uh, an armor coating covers the uh, material that's inside, so the technique was to grind the tooth and then expose the DNA to the surface from where it could be recovered. We analyzed that with the uh, technology of the day, which uh, improved in a couple of years. The results, initial results were confirmed with additional testing, and it was determined that they were not a boy and a girl. In fact, they were two boys that were related uh, as half-brothers. They shared a mother but not a father. And so uh, that became an extremely important uh, part of the investigation because it changed the thinking at the time and obviously changed the scope of the investigation where the police were looking for a young boy and girl.